Section 4 of Myths Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Myths Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Section 4. The Pomegranate Seeds Part 2. But my story must now clamber out of King Pluto's dominions and see what Mother Ceres has been about since she was bereft of her daughter. We had a glimpse of her, as you remember, half hidden among the waving grain, while the four black steeds were swiftly whirling along the chariot in which her beloved Proserpina was so unwillingly borne away. You recollect, too, the loud scream which Proserpina gave just when the chariot was out of sight. Of all the child's outcries, this last shriek was the only one that reached the ears of Mother Ceres. She had mistaken the rumbling of the chariot wheels for a peal of thunder, and imagined that a shower was coming up, and that it would assist her in making the corn grow. But at the sound of Proserpina's shriek she started, and looked about in every direction, not knowing whence it came, but feeling almost certain that it was her daughter's voice. It seemed so unaccountable, however, that the girl should have strayed over so many lands and seas, which she herself could not have traversed without the aid of her winged dragons, that the good Ceres tried to believe that it must be the child of some other parent, and not her own darling Proserpina, who had uttered this lamentable cry. Nevertheless, it troubled her, with a vast many tender fears, such as are ready to bestir themselves in every mother's heart, when she finds it necessary to go away from her dear children, without leaving them under the care of some maiden aunt or other such faithful guardian. So she quickly left the field in which she had been so busy, and as her work was not half done, the grain looked next day as if it needed both sun and rain, and as if it were blighted in the ear and had something the matter with its roots. The pair of dragons must have had very nimble wings, for in less than an hour Mother Ceres had alighted at the door of her home and found it empty. Knowing, however, that the child was fond of sporting on the seashore, she hastened thither as fast as she could, and there beheld the wet faces of the poor sea-nymphs peeping over a wave. All this while the good creatures had been waiting on the bank of sponge, and once every half-minute or so, had popped up their four heads above water to see if their playmate were yet coming back. When they saw Mother Ceres, they sat down on the crest of the surf wave and let it toss them ashore at her feet. "'Where is Proserpina?' cried Ceres. "'Where is my child? "'Tell me, you naughty sea-nymphs, "'have you enticed her under the sea?' "'Oh, no, good Mother Ceres,' said the innocent sea-nymphs, "'tossing back their green ringlets and looking her in the face.' "'We never should dream of such a thing. "'Proserbina has been at play with us, it is true, "'but she left us a long while ago, "'meaning only to run a little way upon the dry land "'and gather some flowers for a wreath. "'This was early in the day, "'and we have seen nothing of her since.' "'Ceres scarcely waited to hear what the nymphs had to say "'before she hurried off to make inquiries all through the neighbourhood. "'But nobody told her anything,' "'that could enable the poor mother to guess what had become of Proserpina. "'A fisherman, it is true, had noticed her little footprints in the sand "'as he went homeward along the beach with a basket of fish. "'A rustic had seen the child stooping to gather flowers. "'Several persons had heard either the rattling of chariot wheels "'or the rumbling of distant thunder, "'and one old woman, while placking vervain and catnip, "'had heard a scream, but supposed it to be some childish nonsense, and therefore did not take the trouble to look up. The stupid people! It took them such a tedious while to tell the nothing that they knew, that it was dark night before Mother Ceres found out that she must seek her daughter elsewhere. So she lighted a torch and set forth, resolving never to come back until Proserpina was discovered. In her haste and trouble of mind, she quite forgot her car and the winged dragons, or, it may be, she thought that she could follow up the search more thoroughly on foot. At all events, this was the way in which she began her sorrowful journey, holding the torch before her, and looking carefully at every object along the path, 
and as it happened she had not gone far before she found one of the magnificent flowers which grew on the shrub that Proserpina had pulled up. Ha! thought Mother Ceres, examining it by torchlight. Here is mischief in this flower. The earth did not produce it by any help of mine, nor of its own accord. It is the work of enchantment, and is therefore poisonous, and perhaps it has poisoned my poor child. But she put the poisonous flower in her bosom, not knowing whether she might ever find any other memorial of Proserpina. All night long, at the door of every cottage and farmhouse, Ceres knocked and called up the weary labourers to inquire if they had seen her child, and they stood gaping and half asleep at their threshold, and answered her pityingly, and besought her to come in and rest. At the portal of every palace, too, she made so loud a summons that the menials hurried to throw open the gate, thinking that it must be some great king or queen, who would demand a banquet for supper, and a stately chamber to repose in. And when they saw only a sad and anxious woman, with a torch in her hand and a wreath of withered poppies on her head, they spoke rudely, and sometimes threatened to set the dogs upon her. But nobody had seen Proserpina, nor could give Mother Ceres the least hint which way to seek her. Thus passed the night, and still she continued her search without sitting down to rest, or stopping to take food, or even remembering to put out the torch. Although first the rosy dawn, and then the glad light of the morning sun, made its red flame look thin and pale. But I wonder what sort of stuff this torch was made of, for it burned dimly through the day, and at night was as bright as ever, and never was extinguished by the rain or wind in all the weary days and nights while Ceres was seeking for Proserpina. It was not merely of human beings that she asked tidings of her daughter, in the woods and by the stream she met creatures of another nature, who used in those old times to haunt the pleasant and solitary places, and were very sociable with persons who understood their language and customs, as Mother Ceres did. Sometimes, for instance, she tapped with her finger against the knotted trunk of a majestic oak, and immediately its rude bark would cleave asunder, and forth would step a beautiful maiden, who was the hamadryad of the oak, dwelling inside it, and sharing its long life, and rejoicing when its green leaves sported with the breeze. But not one of these leafy damsels had seen Proserpina. Then, going a little further, Ceres would, perhaps, come to a fountain gushing out of a pebbly hollow in the earth, and would dabble with her hand in the water. Behold, up through its sandy and pebbly bed, along with the fountain's gush, a young woman with dripping hair would arise, and stand gazing at Mother Ceres half out of the water, and undulating up and down with its ever-restless motion. But when the mother asked whether the poor lost child had stopped to drink out of the fountain, the naiad, with weeping eyes, for these water-nymphs had tears to spare for everybody's grief, would answer, No, in a murmuring voice, which was just like the murmur of the stream. Often, likewise, she encountered fawns, who looked like sunburnt country people, except that they had hairy ears, and little horns upon their foreheads, and the hinder legs of goats, on which they gambled merrily about the woods and fields. They were a frolicsome kind of creature, but grew as sad as their cheerful dispositions would allow, when Ceres inquired for her daughter, and they had no good news to tell. But sometimes she came suddenly upon a rude gang of satyrs, who had faces like monkeys, and horses' tails behind them, and who were generally dancing in a very boisterous manner, with shouts of noisy laughter. When she stopped to question them, they would only laugh the louder and make new merriment out of the lone woman's distress. How unkind of those ugly satyrs! And once, while crossing a solitary sheep pasture, she saw a personage named Pan, seated at the foot of the tall rock, and making music on a shepherd's flute, he too had horns and hairy ears and goat's feet, but, being acquainted with Mother Ceres, he answered her question as civilly as he knew how, and invited her to taste some milk and honey out of a wooden bowl. But neither could Pan tell her what had become of Proserpina, any better than the rest of these wild people. And thus Mother Ceres went wandering about for nine long days and nights, finding no trace of Proserpina, unless it were now and then a withered flower, and these she picked up and put in her bosom, because she fancied that they might have fallen from her poor child's hand. 
All day she travelled onward through the hot sun, and at night again the flame of the torch would redden and gleam along the pathway, and she continued her search by its light without ever sitting down to rest. On the tenth day she chanced to espy the mouth of a cavern within which, though it was bright noon everywhere else, there would have been only a dusky twilight, but it so happened that a torch was burning there. It flickered and struggled with the duskiness, but could not half light up the gloomy cavern with all its melancholy glimmer. Ceres was resolved to leave no spot without a search, so she peeped into the entrance of the cave and lighted it up a little more by holding her own torch before her. In so doing, she caught a glimpse of what seemed to be a woman sitting on the brown leaves of the last autumn, a great heap of which had been swept into the cave by the wind. This woman, if woman it were, was by no means so beautiful as many of her sex, for her head, they tell me, was shaped very much like a dog's, and, by way of ornament, she wore a wreath of snakes around it. But Mother Ceres, the moment she saw her, knew that this was an odd kind of person, who put all her enjoyment in being miserable, and never would have a word to say to other people, unless they were as melancholy and wretched as she herself delighted to be. I am wretched enough now, thought poor Ceres, to talk with this melancholy Hecate, were she ten times sadder than ever she was yet. So she stepped into the cave and sat down on the withered leaves by the dog-headed woman's side. In all the world, since her daughter's loss, she had found no other companion. Oh, Hecate, she said, if ever you lose a daughter, you will know what sorrow is. Tell me, for pity's sake, have you seen my poor child Proserpina pass by the mouth of your cavern? No, answered Hecate, in a cracked voice and sighing betwixt every word or two. No, Mother Ceres, I have seen nothing of your daughter, but my ears, you must know, are made in such a way that all cries of distress and affright all over the world are pretty sure to find their way to them. And nine days ago, as I sat in my cave, making myself very miserable, I heard the voice of a young girl shrieking as if in great distress. Something terrible has happened to the child, you may rest assured. As well as I could judge, a dragon, or some other cruel monster, was carrying her away. "'You kill me by saying so,' cried Ceres, almost ready to faint. "'Where was the sound, and which way did it seem to go?' It passed very swiftly along, said Hecate, and at the same time there was a heavy rumbling of wheels towards the eastward. I can tell you nothing more, except that, in my honest opinion, you will never see your daughter again. The best advice I can give you is to take up your abode in this cavern, where we will be the two most wretched women in the world. Not yet, dark Hecate, replied Ceres. But do you first come with your torch and help me to seek for my lost child? And when there shall be no more hope of finding her, if that black day is ordained to come, then, if you will give me room to fling myself down, either on these withered leaves or on the naked rock, I will show you what it is to be miserable. But until I know that she has perished from the face of the earth, I will not allow myself space even to grieve." The dismal Hecate did not much like the idea of going abroad into the sunny world, but then she reflected that the sorrow of the disconsolate Ceres would be like a gloomy twilight round about them both, let the sun shine ever so brightly, and that therefore she might enjoy her bad spirits quite as well as if she were to stay in the cave. So she finally consented to go, and they set out together, both carrying torches, although it was broad daylight and clear sunshine. The torchlight seemed to make a gloom, so that the people whom they met along the road could not very distinctly see their figures, and indeed if they once caught a glimpse of Hecate, with the wreath of snakes around her forehead, they generally thought it prudent to run away without waiting for a second glance. As the pair travelled along in this woe-begone manner, a thought struck Ceres. "'There is one person,' she exclaimed, "'who must have seen my poor child, and can doubtless tell what has become of her.' "'Why did I not think of him before? It is Phoebus.' "'What?' said Hecate. "'The young man that always sits in the sunshine. "'Oh, pray do not think of going near him. "'He is a gay, light, frivolous young fellow, "'and will only smile in your face. "'And besides, there is such a glare of the sun about him "'that he will quite blind my poor eyes, "'which I have almost wept away already.' 
"'You have promised to be my companion,' answered Ceres. "'Come, let us make haste, or the sunshine will be gone, and Phoebus along with it.' Accordingly they went along in quest of Phoebus, both of them sighing grievously, and Hecate, to say the truth, making a great deal worse lamentation than Ceres, for all the pleasure she had, you know, lay in being miserable, and therefore she made the most of it. By and by, after a pretty long journey, they arrived at the sunniest spot in the whole world. There they beheld a beautiful young man with long, curling ringlets, which seemed to be made of golden sunbeams. His garments were like light summer clouds, and the expression of his face was so exceedingly vivid that Hecate held her hands before her eyes, muttering that he ought to wear a black veil. Phoebus, for this was the very person whom they were seeking, had a lyre in his hands, and was making its chords tremble with sweet music, at the same time singing a most exquisite song, which he had recently composed, for, besides a great many other accomplishments, this young man was renowned for his admirable poetry. As Ceres and her dismal companion approached him, Phoebus smiled on them so cheerfully that Hecate's wreath of snakes gave a spiteful hiss, and Hecate heartily wished herself back in her cave. But as for Ceres, she was too earnest in her grief either to know or care whether Phoebus smiled or frowned. Phoebus, exclaimed she, I am in great trouble and have come to you for assistance. Can you tell me what has become of my dear child Proserpina? Proserpina? Proserpina, did you call her name? answered Phoebus, endeavouring to recollect, for there was such a continual flow of pleasant ideas in his mind that he was apt to forget what had happened no longer ago than yesterday. Ah, yes, I remember her now, a very lovely child indeed. I am happy to tell you, my dear madam, that I did see the little Proserpina not many days ago. You may make yourself perfectly easy about her. She is safe and in excellent hands. Oh, where is my dear child? cried Ceres, clasping her hands and flinging herself at his feet. Why, said Phoebus, and as he spoke, he kept touching his lyre so as to make a thread of music run in and out among his words. As the little damsel was gathering flowers, and she really has a very exquisite taste for flowers, she was suddenly snatched up by King Pluto and carried off to his dominions. I have never been in that part of the universe, but the royal palace, I am told, is built in a very noble style of architecture, and of the most splendid and costly materials. Gold, diamonds, pearls, and all manner of precious stones will be your daughter's ordinary playthings. I recommend to you, my dear lady, to give yourself no uneasiness. Proserpina's sense of beauty will be duly gratified, and, even in spite of the lack of sunshine, she will lead a very enviable life. Hush! Say not a word, answered Ceres indignantly. What is there to gratify her heart? What are all the splendours you speak of without affection? I must have her back again. Will you go with me, Phoebus, to demand my daughter of this wicked Pluto? Pray excuse me, replied Phoebus, with an elegant obeisance. I certainly wish you success, and regret that my own affairs are so immediately pressing that I cannot have the pleasure of attending you. Besides, I am not upon the best of terms with King Pluto. To tell you the truth, his three-headed mastiff would never let me pass the gateway, for I should be compelled to take a sheaf of sunbeams along with me, and those, you know, are forbidden things in Pluto's kingdom. Ah, Phoebus, said Ceres, with bitter meaning in her words, you have a harp instead of a heart. Farewell. Will you not stay a moment, asked Phoebus, to hear me turn the pretty and touching story of Proserpina into extemporary verse? But Ceres shook her head, and hastened away along with Hecate. Phoebus, who, as I have told you, was an exquisite poet, forthwith began to make an ode about the poor mother's grief, and if we were to judge of his sensibility by this beautiful production, he must have been endowed with a very tender heart. But when a poet gets into the habit of using his heart-strings to make chords for his lyre, he may thrum upon them as much as he will, without any great pain to himself. Accordingly, though Phoebus sang a very sad song, he was as merry all the while as were the sunbeams amid which he dwelt. Poor Mother Ceres had now found out what had become of her daughter, but was not a whit happier than before. 
Her case, on the contrary, looked more desperate than ever. As long as Proserpina was above ground, there might have been hopes of regaining her. But now that the poor child was shut up within the iron gates of the King of the Mines, at the threshold of which lay the three-headed Cerberus, there seemed no possibility of her ever making her escape. The dismal Hecate, who loved to take the darkest view of things, told Ceres that she had better come with her to the cavern and spend the rest of her life in being miserable. Ceres answered that Hecate was welcome to go back thither herself, but that, for her part, she would wander about the earth in quest of the entrance to King Pluto's dominions. And Hecate took her at her word and hurried back to her beloved cave, frightening a great many little children with a glimpse of her dog's face as she went. Poor Mother Ceres, it is melancholy to think of her pursuing her toilsome way all alone, and holding up that never-dying torch, the flame of which seemed an emblem of the grief and hope that burned together in her heart. So much did she suffer that, though her aspect had been quite youthful when her troubles began, she grew to look like an elderly person in a very brief time. She cared not how she was dressed, nor had she ever thought of flinging away the wreath of withered poppies, which she put on the very morning of Proserpina's disappearance. She roamed about in so wild a way, and with her hair so dishevelled, that people took her for some distracted creature, and never dreamed that it was Mother Ceres who had the oversight of every seed which the husbandman planted. Nowadays, however, she gave herself no trouble about seed time, nor harvest, but left the farmers to take care of their own affairs, and the crops to fade or flourish, as the case might be. There was nothing now in which Ceres seemed to feel an interest, unless when she saw children at play or gathering flowers along the wayside. Then, indeed, she would stand and gaze at them with tears in her eyes. The children, too, appeared to have a sympathy with her grief, and would cluster themselves in a little group about her knees, and look up wistfully in her face, and Ceres, after giving them a kiss all round, would lead them to their homes and advise their mothers never to let them stray out of sight. For if they do, said she, it may happen to you as it happened to me, that the iron-hearted King Pluto will take a liking to your darlings and snatch them up in his chariot and carry them away. One day, during her pilgrimage in quest of the entrance to Pluto's kingdom, she came to the palace of King Celius, who reigned at Eleusis. Ascending a lofty flight of steps, she entered the portal and found the royal household in very great alarm about the queen's baby. The infant, it seems, was sickly, being troubled with its teeth, I suppose, and would take no food, and was all the time moaning with pain. The queen, her name was Metanira, was desirous of finding a nurse, and when she beheld a woman of matronly aspect coming up the palace steps, she thought in her own mind that here was the very person whom she needed. So Queen Metanira ran to the door, with the poor wailing baby in her arms, and besought Ceres to take charge of it, at least to tell her what would do it good. "'Will you trust the child entirely to me?' asked Ceres. "'Yes, and gladly too,' answered the Queen. "'If you will devote all your time to him, for I can see that you have been a mother.' "'You are right,' said Ceres. "'I once had a child of my own. "'Well, I will be the nurse of this poor, sickly boy, "'but beware, I warn you, that you do not interfere "'with any kind of treatment which I may judge proper for him. "'If you do so, the poor infant must suffer for his mother's folly.' "'Then she kissed the child, and it seemed to do him good, "'for he smiled and nestled closely into her bosom. "'So Mother Ceres set her torch in a corner, "'where it kept burning all the while.' and took up her abode in the palace of King Celius, as nurse to the little prince de Mophoon. She treated him as if he were her own child, and allowed neither the king nor the queen to say whether he should be bathed in warm or cold water, or what he should eat, or how often he should take the air, or when he should be put to bed. You would hardly believe me if I were to tell how quickly the baby prince got rid of his ailments, and grew fat and rosy and strong, and how he had two rows of ivory teeth in less time than any other little fellow, before or since. Instead of the palest and wretchedest and puniest imp in the world, as his own mother confessed him to be when Ceres first took him in charge, he was now a strapping baby, crowing, laughing, kicking up his heels, 
and rolling from one end of the room to the other. All the good women of the neighborhood crowded to the palace and held up their hands in unutterable amazement at the beauty and wholesomeness of this darling little prince. Their wonder was the greater because he was never seen to taste any food, not even so much as a cup of milk. Pray, nurse, the queen kept saying, how is it that you make the child thrive so? I was a mother once, Ceres always replied, and having nursed my own child, I know what other children need. But Queen Metanira, as was very natural, had a great curiosity to know precisely what the nurse did to her child. One night, therefore, she hid herself in the chamber where Ceres and the little prince were accustomed to sleep. There was a fire in the chimney, and it had now crumbled into great coals and embers, which lay glowing on the hearth, with a blaze flickering up now and then, and flinging a warm and ruddy light upon the walls. Ceres sat before the hearth with the child in her lap, and the firelight making her shadow dance upon the ceiling overhead. She undressed the little prince and bathed him all over with some fragrant liquid out of a vase. The next thing she did was to rake back the red embers and make a hollow place among them, just where the backlog had been. At last, when the baby was crowing and clapping his fat little hands, and laughing in the nurse's face, just as you may have seen your little brother or sister do before going into its warm bath, Ceres suddenly laid him, all naked as he was, in the hollow among the red-hot embers. She then raked the ashes over him, and turned quietly away. You may imagine, if you can, how Queen Metanira shrieked, thinking nothing less than that her dear child would be burned to a cinder. She burst forth from her hiding-place, and running to the hearth, raked open the fire, and snatched up poor little Prince de Mofawam, out of his bed of live coals, one of which he was gripping in each of his fists. He immediately set up a grievous cry, as babies are apt to do, when rudely startled out of a sound sleep. To the Queen's astonishment and joy, she could perceive no token of the child's being injured by the hot fire in which he had lain. She now turned to Mother Ceres and asked her to explain the mystery. "'Foolish woman,' answered Ceres, "'did you not promise to entrust this poor infant entirely to me? "'You little know the mischief you have done him. "'Had you left him to my care, "'he would have grown up like a child of celestial birth, "'endowed with human strength and intelligence, "'and would have lived for ever. "'Do you imagine that earthly children are to become immortal "'without being tempered to it in the fiercest heat of the fire? "'But you have ruined your own son.' "'for though he will be a strong man and a hero in his day, "'yet on account of your folly he will grow old "'and finally die like the sons of other women. "'The weak tenderness of his mother "'has cost the poor baby an immortality. "'Farewell.' "'Saying these words, "'she kissed the little prince de Mofawam "'and sighed to think what he had lost, "'and took her departure without heeding Queen Metanira, "'who entreated her to remain,' and cover up the child among the hot embers as often as she pleased. Poor baby, he never slept so warmly again. End of section 4